Welcome back to yet another episode of The Average Kitchen, and we're going to review another Ninja Air Fryer. This one is the Ninja Foodie Smart XL Pressure Cooking Steam Fryer with Smart Lid. It was a bit of a mouthful. You'll probably remember about a year and a half ago, we did the same size Ninja Pressure Cooker Air Fryer, but it had two lids. The newest technology is a single lid, so I'm really excited about that. Also has a built-in meat probe, so we're gonna run it through a series of tests today to give you a real good idea if this is a good product for you to maybe buy. Not cheap, uh, we are not affiliated whatsoever to Ninja, we buy these products with our own money. I'm trying to remember roughly $500 Canadian, maybe even a little bit more, I'd have to look it up. I'm not a cheap product, but I hope it's gonna be worth it. I, I've tried it once. First thing we're gonna start out with is steaming uh, a bunch of carrots. So as you can see here, I have roughly two pounds of carrots. I won't bore you with peeling them all, but I am gonna peel these, get them ready to go, and then uh, we're gonna uh, pressure cook them. Because there's two options, you could pressure cook or steam. And when I was looking in the book, and I don't really know why, to pressure cook them is three minute cook, to steam them is 18 to 20 minutes. So I don't know why anybody would steam over pressure cook, but if you know, let me know. Leave me a comment and I'd love to find out because I don't, I don't know what the advantage would be. So if you're new to uh, Ninja products and not overly familiar with uh, these uh, specific products, you, you get a basket, which we're gonna show when we do some fries and wings and stuff later, and then you get the dual layer rack. So that's what we're gonna use in this case. Now the book suggests to cut them into one inch cubes or, or you know medallions or whatever. I, I don't really think it makes a huge difference on how you cut your carrots. I'm gonna just do them like this. So I put in one cup of uh, warm or hot water. It's not necessary, you could put cold water if you want. This just sort of uh, expedites the process. So there you'll see it. We're gonna close our lid. We're going to turn it on. So you'll see all the different options sort of flash through here. We're gonna to wanna to slide this over to pressure. You'll see pressure is set there. We want it on high. We're gonna set it for three minutes on high. We'll make sure our valve is not locked into place. On the right hand side, you'll see, you can't probably see in the camera, it says seal and vent. And we're gonna press start. It probably usually takes about eight to 10 minutes or it did before to get it up to pressure before it starts to work. You'll, you'll see or you may not see, the timer won't even start until the machine is up to pressure and ready to go. Then once it starts to actually pressure cook, then your timer will start to count down. Yeah, I'll just time that to see just for fun how long it takes to actually build that pressure up. Uh, you'll see here that our timer just started counting down. Jamie and I quickly came over to the island to, to get back on the camera here. So I did time, it was 12 minutes. 12 minutes to get up to pressure. You'll see it very quiet, you can't hear anything. Now I've never pressure cooked with this specific model and because it has this quick release, I'm very curious to see how that's gonna work. Because on the, on the old model, you would have to use a wooden spoon, click this over and, and manually release the pressure. What's cool about these as well is if, you don't, if you're around the house doing something else, once the timer counts down, it'll switch to keep warm or at least the old one did, I suspect this will do the same. But I'm very curious to see how this quick release, which is listed here, how that actually works. Oh, I see, release pressure. Oh, that's interesting, okay. Wow, very cool. Little bit of a startle factor there. Really kind of funny actually. If you've if you haven't watched our video from a year and a half ago, because I had it was an unboxing and I had never used one of these before, I had reached over with my hand to release the pressure and it scared the crap out of me. And it made for some really good footage on our uh, review. Ow! Ow! But this one, I don't have to worry about that because it does it automatically. So that's really, really neat. Uh, we never timed that, but it probably only took, what, three or four minutes, Jamie? Yep. The lid will not physically open until the, it's safe to do so and that the pr pressure has been released. So we're gonna open this up. Oh no, I think we have to unlock that. There. Open that up. Whew. Glass has got a little steamy there. Okay, so these, to me, are, are cooked perfectly. They're not mush, but there's still a little bit of uh, texture to them. You can see obviously it's really hot. Yeah, really good. I mean, it's a steamed carrot, but very, very good.
I just took my potatoes out of the uh, cold water and I threw my basket in. I gave it just a little spray and some cooking spray. It's not necessary, you don't have to do that. I just tend to. And I'd like to kind of preheat this actually. So I'm gonna go to air fry. So you'll see in the air fry set setting here, you've got air fryer, air fry, broil, bake, dehydrate, proof, which I don't even know what that means, sear, saute, steam, sous vide, slow cook, yogurt. So we're gonna use the air fry setting and we're gonna set it for probably, we'll say 40 minutes to start, and I'm gonna just start to preheat that now. So we're gonna hit start. So we'll throw our potatoes in our uh, large stainless steel bowl here, and I'm gonna throw in two tablespoons of just standard vegetable oil. And then I'm gonna throw in, and I've been doing this lately as well, and it's worked out quite well, half a teaspoon of cornstarch. Flutter that in there like that, really helps crisp up to get those really crunchy, crispy fries. Just wanna make sure with the corn surf that you don't have any big chunks. So I'll ditch my glove, open up my lid, and we're gonna dump those in. As my timer was counting up, I'll reset my timer. Like I said, I set it for uh, 40 minutes, but we'll check them throughout. Usually every 10, 12 minutes, I like to check on them, give the basket a shake, measure how they look as far as my desired uh, level of crispiness. Jamie and I have done a lot of reviews on air fryers. Some of them are quite a bit louder than others. This one we're finding, because it's the first time I've air fried with it, is it's actually really not that bad. So Jamie's got this real cool app on his phone. It's a decibel reader, so I'll stop talking for a second and we'll see what it's gonna give us. So right around 59 or 60, which this is saying is basically equivalent to a conversation. So I would say that's pretty reasonable. Maybe you don't even care about the decibel or how loud it is, but for us, because we've done so many of these, we definitely notice a difference between different products, and this one's pretty good. So we're roughly 13 minutes into the cook on our uh, homemade fries here. So we'll open that up. You can already see they're starting to brown up, which is really, really nice. And we're just gonna grab that basket and just give them a little light toss here to loosen them up and to make sure we're getting consistent cook. We'll close that lid. All right, 27 minutes into our uh, cook here. Let's have another quick peek. All right, so these are really looking good, but you can see the difference when you flip those around. It's really necessary to give those a toss to be able to get that consistently uh, cooked evenly all the way through. 34 minutes in, I'm gonna say we're gonna be good here. They look fantastic. And I think fries are somewhat subjective as well to people's um, desired level of crispiness of what they like or what they think is a perfect fry. But to me, these are like, you know, a kind of rough cut, nice looking homemade fry that's not deep fried. Of course, you can never compare deep fried fries to anything else. They're basically the best, but they're not necessarily the best for you. So it's kind of on the thinner side while it's really hot. Give it a little ketchup dip. Let me give it a try. Even with a thinner fry, there's still some meaty, soft potato in the middle there, which is really, really nice. Crispy on the outside, but not crunchy, but crispy on the outside and soft in the middle. So to me, that is a perfectly cooked potato, perfectly cooked homemade fry in the air fryer. All right, so I've got roughly a pound of raw chicken wings here. Now we have done uh, wing videos before in different reviews. Everybody has a different level of doneness or crispiness. Myself and Jamie are crispy wing guys. To me, it's worth a little bit of extra time to make sure that they're cooked the way you like them. All right, so let's open up our air fryer here and we're just gonna dump those wings right in. And we're gonna be keeping an eye on those and giving them a toss probably every 10 to 12 minutes. So I got it set here for 42 minutes. I'll set it for 40, it probably won't take that long, but that'll give us a good starting point. So we're 13 minutes in on uh, the wing cook here. We don't have a huge amount of wings. I've, I've done, uh, in my previous air fryer, uh, done bigger batches of wings, and I find sometimes they can kind of stick together, so you gotta shake them more often. Because this is a smaller batch, I'm not too concerned with that. But you can have a quick look. They are cooking up nice, but we'll just, yeah, so they're all loose and uh, not sticking to the bottom or anything like that, as they shouldn't, but kind of nice just to have a quick look and see how they're progressing. 27 minutes into our cook, let's have a look. Those are done and extra crispy just the way we like them. So that was 27 minutes to cook those. Nice and golden brown, nice and crispy. Let me grab a wing here and some, a uh, little bit of Frank's Buffalo that I like. Let's try them out. Actually, they're cooked really well. They're kind of on the smaller side of the wings, but they're actually really, really good. Really nice, moist inside. Mm -hmm. 
Next, I'm gonna try something that I've never ever done before, is a twice baked potato. And I'm gonna follow this recipe that's in the Ninja book. You can see it here, twice baked potatoes. They talk about adding a cup of water to the bottom layer of the deluxe reversible rack and putting the deluxe reversible rack in the lowest position. All right, so I'm gonna add my water in. Then I'm gonna put the deluxe reversible rack in the lowest position as suggested. Then they talk about the foodie smart thermometer in the center of the largest potato. So where you access that is Jamie, I don't know if you can see here, Jamie, it's right here. This is the uh, smart thermometer. You can see it right here. So the way that this works, Jamie, you might have to come around this side a little bit is, now we've been using this a lot, it's a little hot there. So to see this plug that came out, you definitely don't wanna lose this, but that is where your thermometer plugs into your Ninja like so. So they also talk about stabbing your potato, which is not abnormal when you're cooking potatoes. They always sort of suggest a couple fork marks throughout the potato. It talks about putting the thermometer in one of the larger potatoes. So we're just gonna do two potatoes today. They're not massive. Hopefully this should feed in pretty good. And it did. So you see that in there like that, sitting there. This one's gonna go here like this. We're gonna close our lid and make sure obviously our thermometer stays inside. We got the slider in the middle, it's steam and crisp. So we're gonna select steam and crisp. We're gonna go to 400, then we're gonna select manual, and then we're gonna set our, set our target temperature to 200 degrees. And then we're gonna hit start. <whistles> what we don't know is how long that's actually gonna take because there's no time listed in the um, book. It does say it will take roughly eight minutes to get up to pressure, but I guess it'll let us know whenever it's ready to be removed. So maybe I'll set a timer on my phone just to see what kind of time frame that takes. We just hit 200, doesn't actually even show it, but we just hit 200 on the probe, which then automatically turned off the Ninja, and it took 35 minutes. That's from the time I started it, not even, that includes the pre, build up time. So 35 minutes to get those potatoes to 200. Okay, so the first thing I notice is, which is a little bit of an issue, is there's no water left at all, and it looks like the bottom of that almost looks a little bit cooked. We'll pull out our potato. So the next part of the instructions is it says to give them five minutes-ish to cool off, and then we're gonna cut into the potato, clean out all the inside, mix up the inside of that potato with sour cream, bacon, and cheese, put it back into the potato, put it back into the air fryer, and broil it to um, cook the cheese on top. So we're gonna carefully put this back into the air fryer, close our lid, slide it over to air fry, select broil, 450 for five minutes, it's saying. And we'll see what's gonna happen. Moment of truth, let's have a look. Ooh, beauty. See those, Jamie? So that wiped out pretty good. I don't know if you saw that there, Jamie. Try to remove these without burning myself. Okay, so I think the smart thing would do, to do would be to give these a little bit of time to cool down. Two forks, one knife. So let's uh, give Jamie a fork here, let's cut into it. So Jamie, help yourself. Never made this before, definitely gonna make it again. Absolutely fantastic. Jamie, it's unbelievable. super well cooked, creamy from the sour cream, bacon makes everything amazing. Yeah, this is really, really, really good. Don't mind me. So the next thing I wanna do is the creamy tomato soup with grilled cheese croutons. It says close lid and move slider to air fry stove top. So oh, air fry stove top, select sear saute, which Ironically, I'm on, and set to four. Okay, so we're gonna let that preheat, and they suggest to preheat it for five minutes. And at the five minute mark, we're gonna add in, uh, I got half of an onion, or really it's a full onion, but it was a half of a massive red onion, garlic, and some canola oil, and we're going to saute those Sorry, Jamie. We're gonna saute those before we start adding our tomato and tomato puree and our heavy cream and so on and so forth. So let's give that five minutes to heat up. Five minutes, you'll see, just uh, rolled past it. Essentially what we're gonna do is we wanna saute our onions, garlic, and our oil. So we're gonna open that up and pour that oil in. We'll get our onions going. Oh, listen to that sizzle. And Jamie brought up a really good point when we're sort of waiting for this to warm up is, but the technology in these air fryers and so on and so forth nowadays, especially this one, there's pretty much nothing it can't do. The only limitation essentially is the size of the unit of, you know, how many people you're cooking for. If you're only cooking for yourself or maybe you just have a small family, I think this is, you know, something that could be really, really helpful of, of replacing 
you know, your stove or whatever. So it hasn't quite been the full five minutes yet, but by looking at this, and I don't know if you can get a shot there, Jamie, to me, it's, it's quite uh, sauteed, so I'm comfortable with that. So I'm gonna jump into the next stage here of adding crushed tomato, tomato puree, heavy cream, water, salt, Worcestershire crushed red pepper. So let's do that. So I got a full can of crushed tomato, or sorry, diced tomato. Got a whole can of crushed tomato. And we've got two cups of 35% heavy cream. And we're gonna put in some chili flake. Calls for half a cup of water. I don't know if I'm gonna put it all in. So I'd rather it be a little on the thicker side. Well, you know what? I'm gonna follow the instructions. Two tablespoons of Worcestershire. We'll give that a mix. Close our lid. We're gonna slide all the way over to pressure. We want it on high and start. So it says it's roughly gonna take 13 minutes to build up the pressure to when it's now pressurized and then it'll start cooking down in our 10 minutes. I guess that's cool, it gives you a fair warning. So quite a buildup of steam here. We got some residual, I'm not even, okay, I think it says you can open the lid, right? Good timing. Gotta unlock it there. Now my only first concern here, I'm very concerned, is basically, it looks like, what is that? Like, is that burnt tomato? I would say it is. Tastes okay. It looks like the tomato skins burnt. I would say that's exactly what happened. I think if you made this without diced tomato, even though it did call for diced tomato, did it not? This called for these fancy croutons with baguette. And um, this morning, my lovely YouTube partner, Jamie, went to the local, local grocery store to get a, new, a brand new fresh baguette. And I started slicing it up and there was mold on it, so. Thumbs down to the local grocery store, that's a piss off. And so is this. I would say this is a total bust. And the only thing I could think to try to avoid this if you were gonna make soup in this manner is to just do crushed tomatoes, not diced and crushed. So I gotta check the book. It, it, it did say diced and crushed, did it not, Jamie? Okay, so that might've been my mistake here. One can of crushed tomato, one can of tomato puree. Let's put that one on me. Doesn't taste bad, but it just has that little kind of charred taste to it. Okay, let's. Scratch this from our memories, let's move on and let's do a beef roast with pan drip gravy. Now they talk about doing it with vegetables. The last time I tried, it was a disaster. I'll talk about that in my review. So I got a roast here, it kind of loses its beautiful red color. It was vacuum sealed and frozen, but nevertheless, it's still a nice roast. So they call for four cups of beef broth. I'm gonna bump it up a little bit. I'm gonna do six cups because a little bit of extra gravy never hurt anybody. So we're gonna pour that into the bottom of our pot here. Beautiful sprig of fresh rosemary, you see here. I'm gonna put that in, our bay leaves, tablespoon of black peppercorns, three tablespoons of minced, uh, pre-cut minced garlic. I'm gonna put in our lower rack here, and then I'm gonna put in our beef roast on our rack, and then we're gonna use our meat probe. We're gonna put that in there like that. So we're gonna turn it on. We're gonna go to steam and crisp, set temperature to 365, then go to preset, Man, it automatically goes to beef, which is what we want. I'm gonna go to medium, and I'm gonna tell you why here in a second. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I've only ever used this once, and I wanted to do a test run of this specific recipe. So what I did was follow the instructions to a T. They talked about oiling some root vegetables, so I had done carrots, a little bit of onion. Probably about 20 minutes into the cook, I'm like, I could smell something burning. So I opened it up, and the Carrots were charred. So I'm like, geez, okay, now what? So I got rid of the carrots, I pulled the beef roast out, drained the uh, dripping and the gravy, and put it into my oven to finish. But it turned out amazing. The, the, the gravy was fantastic, the beef was great. I did notice, and we'll see today, that there's quite a difference between the built-in Ninja thermometer and my handheld quick digital thermometer, off by quite a bit. So normally I would finish this at medium rare, but the last time when I set that, it was really rare. A little bit of a difference there. We had that issue as well with the meat thermometer on the Ninja grill video that we did. It was quite a bit off from what my normal thermometer was. So nevertheless, all that being said, round two with this, no vegetables, and we're gonna see how it's gonna turn out. So we literally just hit our desired temperature of 135, just shut off minutes ago. It took roughly an hour. To cook. Definitely looks cooked. Now we had set it for 135, so that's a major problem. <laughs> 135 and it was showing 170 on my 
probe. So 170, I'd have to even look it up, is like really well done. So let's have a little chat. So Google says that medium is 145. When I set it to medium on here, it was showing 135. But yet when I used my digital thermometer, it was showing between 165 and 170. And by looking at it, it's obviously very, very well done. I, I don't even know what to, to say. I mean, we're using the presettings that are built into Ninja, use the temperature probe provided by Ninja, and this is what we end up with. I'm really disappointed. Overall, I like it way more than the other one with the single lid, really, really nice. Lots of options for different type of cooking, uh, searing, um, you know, steaming, pressure cooking, air frying, so on and so forth. What do we do? We did the carrots, turned out perfect. We did the twice baked potato, unbelievable, really, really impressed. We did the wings, so less cook time than what I normally expect, but they turned out really, really well. The soup, I mean, I guess I kind of messed up, but at the same time, like Jamie and I were discussing, like since when do you have stuff embedded in liquid that parts of it burn. So I, I don't really get that. Like it's diced tomato that's soaking, sopping tomato that somehow they burn. So even though I use diced tomato instead of puree and crushed, I used crushed and diced. Shouldn't make that much of a difference, but it did. That was kind of a total bust. Then we jump into the roast, which I mentioned earlier that I had done before and I had set it for medium rare, which is what I normally would do. And when it said it was done, it was rare, it was completely off. And this time I'm like, okay, I'll counterbalance that and set it for medium and it's like super well done. There's maybe something I'm missing here, but I don't think there is because it's not rocket science. You plug the probe in, you put it to your meat and the machine should cook it till the internal temperature is the 135. But the 135 on my digital probe here, show the machine showing the 135, that's showing 165, 170 on this. So the cleaning generally is pretty easy. Everything usually wipes out pretty seamlessly here. We'll see, and you could probably see, Jamie, I don't know if you could see, it's more on this side actually, I don't know if you could see. There might be a little bit of scrubbing involved there, I'm not sure, but we'll see. But overall, pretty easy to clean. Price point is expensive. Uh, 500 plus Canadian, a lot of money for a uh, kitchen appliance. It is big, it is heavy. I don't know what the exact weight, I'd have to look it up, but I would say 15 to 18 pounds and not easy to store because it's big. I was really looking forward to wrapping this up with this beautiful roast and so on and so forth and be able to say that this is like an amazing piece of machinery, but the last two tests that we did were kind of a total bust. The soup, following it right out of the book. The soup and the beef using the settings exactly how they said. I'm not trying to wing it here. The soup and the, uh, the the roast were kind of a bust. I mean, I haven't cut into this yet. I'm gonna give it a chance to rest, but I think it's pretty fair to say it's gonna be well done, which is not the way that I like to eat roast beef. I'm sure you would agree. So if you're from Corporate Ninja, or Ninja Canada, and you're watching this, hey, hit us up at The Average Kitchen because we're totally confused. Did we do something wrong here? I don't think we did. That's our video. Hope you liked it. Uh, leave us a comment. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and we'll see you on the next one.